Good morning, good morning, good morning. There we are. Let's let you see out the front. Make sure I'm in first and not reverse, otherwise I might have to repair two cars. It's a bit foggy and whatever today. What shall I do? I'm gonna go the turning left. No, I'm not. I'm turning right. <laughs> I told you there, didn't I? You know what's down that way, don't you? Bloody great lake. Lake. My car is brown. It's normally red. <clears throat> and because of the mud, it picks up going through that lake. Well, let's just... Thank you, even though I was here first. <clears throat> so, how you been? How you been? All right? On my way to work, I've got uh, uh, a morning of patients. This morning, my nurse has just rung in and said she's been feeling sick in the car and driving to work, so she's gone round her mum's. Let's get some bit of hot air on the windscreen. That's it. Yeah, so... Uh, working uh ellie who's my um receptionist nurse is going to be nursing today so this is one of the beauties of cross training for your staff always if you can get the nurses comfortable on reception and get the, the receptionist which is more difficult comfortable on the on nursing <coughs> she's um just finished the nursing course taken the exam and uh, all things being equal, I think she's going to get our results today. So we might have some good news or we might have some bad news. By the way, she's nursing for me. I think it's going to be good news. She studied so hard for that. So hard for that. Now, what else? Everybody in the country is going on strike. So what I wanted to do today is cover the subject of strikes. From various different angles whether you're thinking of going on strike, whether you're thinking of not going on strike, whether you've been affected by a strike, whether you think people should go on strike or shouldn't be allowed to go on strike, etc., etc. So let's deal with the most obvious ones first. There's a lot of people jumping up and down, throwing their shoes at the telly, are saying these people should not be allowed to go on strike. And uh, mainly they mean... Um, nurses when they're talking about that so let's just say essential services and uh, the nurses are slightly unusual in that they are one of the very few essential services that doesn't have an agreement with the government not to strike now where you know people say they shouldn't be allowed to strike the police aren't allowed to strike you know the fire brigade isn't allowed to strike and and the answer is that they are um that's because they've reached a negotiated agreement with the government for an improvement in their pay terms and conditions, which offsets their right to strike. So in other words, the government says, we don't want you to go on strike, so we're going to pay you so much that you don't ever need to. And the uh, police have then said, all right then. Now, why would the government do that with the police? The answer is that uh, when there's a lot of civil unrest, especially at times like this, high inflation, lots of strikes, protests, etc., uh, the government needs the police. Ultimately, they need the army, but mostly they need the police. And the police is the, um, you know, is the, the violent arm, if you like, of Westminster. It's the arm that they require <coughs> to, ma <coughs> to maintain control and crack a few skulls if things get out of hand. And so you cannot have the police going on strike. So in the same way as in these tin pot dictator countries where the uh, the dictator loses the support of the army and the army steps in and says, we'll have a new tin pot dictator, you know, the one that, that we like, um, of our choice, of our choosing, um, forget the elections. Uh, in the same way, the in this country, the government relies on the police to uh, make sure that things stay under control and uh, they mustn't lose the support of the police. The police has to, not that I'm saying that the police would ever change the government really, but the 
the police would and have in the past been very hypercritical of home various home secretaries if they haven't uh, paid them enough or uh, you know give, militarized them enough given them the uh, the cs gas and the pepper spray and the smoke canisters and the stun guns that they want etc etc uh, and uh, this is all stepping up a gear because there's a load of SWAT style vans have been SWAT spotted, spotted all over the country. Big boxy things with police on the side in hyper modern typeface. Uh, and they're, uh, you know, they are all bulletproof, these vans. And so they can be driven like, like literally right into the middle of a, of a shooting situation and shoot back. And that's a big escalation, you know, from the old, uh, the traditional idea of the British policeman being unarmed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and set with a truncheon and a and a whistle and a and a stern word for anybody who gets out, you know, who does anything naughty. So anyway, but let's not deviate too far from the strike the theme, right? So that's why the police can't strike. Now the nurses don't <laughs> don't have such an agreement because they've never gone on strike. And so the government's sort of taking the attitude, well, we don't need to pay them enough not to go on strike because they never do. And so it's, I'm sure it's come as somewhat of a surprise to the government that um, uh, the nurses have finally said, no, enough is enough and up with this, we will not put, etc. cetera. And, uh, and they're going on strike. Now, I'm talking here as someone who has led a national strike and I took the I didn't take them out. They took themselves out on strike, basically. We balloted them. When I was the uh, chief executive of a trade union, recognised trade union, and we balloted them, and then there's lots of requirements. You have to, it has to be done through the Electoral Reform Society, and you have to, uh, you know, go to ACAS beforehand to see if there's any chance of reconciling things without a strike. But, you know, by the time that it comes to a strike ballot, most of the people are pretty fed up and, uh, and you generally you you do you know by the time the union judges it's time to go to a ballot then uh, they will get the result they want and usually they get uh, a high response and they get a positive uh, to a strike in uh, the 80s and the 90 percent then the government has tried to qualify this by saying yeah well that applies to this postcode and you can't say that that applies to that postcode or uh, you know, it, you know they they voted to go on strike this week, and you've got a ballot against next week. To see if they want to go on strike next week, you know. But that's really not the not the approach to deal with the dissatisfaction in the workforce, and that's what they are dealing with. They're dealing with dissatisfaction in the workforce. Now, nurses are a very difficult group to handle because they're such a big group. Everybody, you know, appreciates the work the nurses do, so they can't demonise the nurses. A bit like they demonise the dentists. Nobody likes dentists. People like doctors, and so the doctors get a, pretty much what they ask for. But the dentists, everybody, you know, they, the government plays on the image of dentists being greedy uh, and all walking around wearing crocodile shoes and driving uh, Ferraris and stuff like that. And therefore, uh, that they don't. The last thing they need is any more money. Well, that that when I was when I ran the strike. That worked against us and you know with hindsight we should have expected it to and not expecting any different outcome and the, well, the trouble with strikes is that you um uh it's always <laughs> you never get it right the first time it's like the first time your parents die you get everything wrong and then the second time your parents die then you you would get it all right because you have learned from the experience and it's the first time when you go on strike or uh, lead a trade union, national trade union goes on strike, you'll do, the, the government will pulverise you. They'll, because of their great experience and their, their greater amount of time that they have to devote to thinking about strategy and independent third party advice and, uh, and they have to a certain extent much more now than then they have the media on their side. In those days it was mainly the Daily Mail was on the government side and the rest of the media was just indifferent. Now, of course, the uh, vast amount of the media is has an agenda, has a narrative, uh, which is um, is almost always pro-government and not very rarely pro-dentist. So, I'll turn that down a bit. So, what can you expect if you go on? You know, 
people like um, this is why I think the Trade Union Congress was so uh, is so useful. It wasn't useful to us because as we really felt as a professional union that we shouldn't affiliate with the TUC. I think it would have been a bigger coup for the TUC to have us as members than than for us to join the TUC. I don't think a lot of the dentists. Our dentist members would have appreciated that. Um, but having said that, it would have given us access to a ton of resources and, and strategy uh, and, and uh, tactical conversations that we never had. And we just, Amalek and I and uh, Ken Weech and to a lesser extent Neville Bainbridge, we just, we just, we were just went honest. We were just honest. We were wanted everywhere. We had a press conference where all the national dailies turned up, you know, with a classic one with all the microphones sticking in your face. And they were asking us questions like, why are you going on strike and stuff like that? And we were saying, well, because we feel that the service is threatened. And they were saying, but don't dentists earn enough already? And we said, well, it's not about wages. It's about um, it's about funding for treatment. And uh, this joke went round that, uh, you know, a dentist had been shot. But the only thing that had saved his life was the fact the bullet had hit his wallet. And uh, that, was, that was the general attitude. And I have to say, not only from the government and the media to a large extent, but also to the public. The public were not sympathetic at all to dentists going on strike. And so we were like, we were campaigning against our major beneficiaries, our biggest stakeholders, the biggest interested group. And when you're fighting on behalf of someone who's fighting against you, then really, you know, you, you, you have got to realise that it's time to stop. When the public are uh, saying that I think the dentists are overpaid and you're just saying, well, look, you know, if you don't if you don't fall in behind us, then you won't have an NHS dental service in 10 years or 20 years or something. And the public are saying, yeah, well, you know, if you could just take a pay cut, everything would be all right. And we should have realized at that point the jig was up, but we didn't. We were very genuine. We fought on. We, you know, and, and uh, the press was saying that the average dentist uh, earns. £175,000 a year and um, we we then had to point out that that was the gross fee income for the practice and it wasn't the dentist income and that practice might have two or three dentists working there and so therefore uh, by the time you've taken off the staff salaries and the materials and the rent then that was what then paid corporate, corporation tax then then the re what was left was what the dentist took home and even that was that was pre-tax that they were paid tax on that. so all these figures were completely unrealistic but yeah they were you know they, they didn't we very rarely got the chance to go into the debate to that extent so <clears throat> obviously if i did it again i would do it differently and i probably wouldn't do it because um and, and this is going to be a subject of another podcast coming up shortly because I had a chance to debate at the um, Parliamentary Exchange. I forget what it's called now. It's called PPE, Public Parliament Exchange or something. And they, they held a debate recently on um, uh, at which m both myself and Barry Cockcroft appeared. And someone came on and she was very irate about the fact that she was constantly getting letters from her constituents saying that uh, she's a local councillor, I think, that there are no NHS dentists and, uh, you know, what was being done about it, and surely with a bit of goodwill on all sides, we could just all get our heads together and, and, and find a solution. And I challenged Barry Cockcroft to explain to this woman why there were no NHS dentists, stating quite clearly that it's my belief that it was on his watch that all the NHS dentists left the NHS. And um, he stated a couple of things which I think were quite useful. Uh, because, and I'll tell you why, because they represent the first attempt to um, debrief the chief dental officer on that period of history. It's the first time I think that he's ever commented on uh, what happened during all those years, you know, the years that started in 88 and 90, uh, with the uh, 1990, the new contract, the 92 fee cut, and that's when everybody started leaving the NHS. And um, he said two things, which I don't think he's ever said before. And one is that he says it's uh, it's uh, a political problem that uh, it's not uh, that it will be solved by political will, but and that if it is anything is wrong, it's because it's not being handled correctly by the, at the top level, uh, government and the civil service. In other words, they're making political mistakes, and that's why the um, 
that's why the service isn't working. And then the other uh, thing he said was that um, that dentists left the service basically because, uh, and at the time most of the dentists left the service, that they were the gatekeepers to the service. In other words, they chose whether they work within the NHS or not. And that the reason why a lot of dentists now don't work within the NHS is because a lot of dentists have chosen to leave the NHS. In other words, they could have done either. They could have done either and they just chose to not work on the NHS. And so, um, and those two things I think are incredibly telling. I think they're incredibly insightful. Um, because they show what the, 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 the fundamental theology, if you like, was that dr drove their approach which was that uh, they were like the masters of the universe and uh, all the problems that were caused by caused by these pesky dentists not wanting to work on the NHS. No acknowledgement at all about market conditions or the, the free market or dentist choice in a free market to work on the NHS or not and the, and the terms and conditions that they were asked to um, conform to. So, you know, it's a bit like a bus company saying that the reason why we've got no bus drivers is because all the people who, um, you know, could have chosen to drive a bus have chosen not to drive a bus. And therefore, it's the bus driver's fault. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I think that's an incredible insight into someone who's like, you know, quite short sighted, quite blinkered in terms of uh, uh, the overall uh, strategy of everything and how, how the world works even, you know. So anyway, so but I'll debrief that later because there's a, there's a dentist there, a young dentist who, who's working on the NHS, and he he pretty well said the same thing. He said, I think that you know, he said like with a bit of goodwill, I think dentists probably could work on the NHS. You know, I don't think I can't see, you know, and and basically it was all it was the old argument that I work on the NHS, therefore I don't see why everyone else can't work on the NHS. You know, because everyone else has got my expenses and everyone else has, lives where I do and everyone else has. Uh, has got my, you know, uh, my my uh, sort of a philanthropic approach to uh, my time and labour. Well, anyway, getting back to the subject of strikes. Okay, so the you know that I've always said and and, and regularly on this uh, podcast that you're only paid what you're worth. Okay, and it's an unfortunate, regrettable, uh, but totally true fact that you're. Uh, how much you're paid depends on how valuable you are and how scarce you are. Same as everything else. And um, it's no use saying that, well, I'm valuable and scarce if you're um, not prepared to make yourself scarcer by going on strike. And um, as the uh, ferry workers found, that they were valuable, uh, but they're not very scarce because uh, when they sacked everybody, you know, working on the cross-channel ferries, um, they, they didn't have the option to go on strike because they were all paid off. Um, they were all given like a redundancy package and a load of other um, you know, people were brought in to do their job. And so there, there was no point in them going on strike because they were totally replaceable. Now, nurses are, there's a lot of, sh uh, and let's bring the, okay, let's do a little sidebar on the employment market. Obviously, if you're, it's difficult for your employer to replace you, then um, you're going to have a stronger position, aren't you? And at the moment, the labour market is quite tight. We've just come out of the European Union. There's not a lot of foreign workers around. There's not uh, a lot of people have just spent two years in lockdown and realised that they can work from home or they can you know, exist quite well on 70% of the money they used to, that they don't want to do the commuting and uh, buy the expensive Starbucks and everything. So there's been a fundamental shift in the labour market and it's been away from the employers. The reason why everyone is going on strike now is because the um, government has um, increased the amount of money in circulation. So there's more money and there's more, more money chasing the same amount of goods and services and, and wages. And therefore everybody wants more of it because it's, it's worth less than it was. It's been devalued by the government and the government is the cause of the problem. Um, you know, and, and they did an analysis in the Sunday Times last week about what are the causes of the various problems. And under inflation, they uh, they listed Ukraine as the biggest uh, cause of inflation, which is just stupid. It's just stupid. 
how you can blame the poor Ukrainians for the inflation. And the other thing they say is, well, everyone's got inflation. It's, it's endemic. It's a worldwide problem. Like it's, like it's the norovirus and we've caught it off everybody else. And the reason why it's endemic is because uh, everyone, like, particularly the United States, started printing money and spending it like a drunken sailor. And so what happens is that they, um, the pound then starts going up. In, in value, in purchasing power relative to the dollar. The dollar goes down in value and the pound goes up. And um, that was a bit cheeky, wasn't it? And, uh, and so what you have to do is you then have to start printing money because you, you don't want the pound to go up against the dollar because it hurts exports. It means that everything we sell abroad gets relatively more expensive, especially in America. And the central banks that are all in cahoots through the Bank of International Settlements and old Augustus Carstead, he's the bloody jab of the heart of bankers. Just Google a picture of him on the internet, I'll tell you, you'll be in gobsmacked. Um, he, uh, they coordinated this printing. They had a massive round of printing because it's, uh, it's the side of Keynesianism that they like, the money printing side. They don't they ever do the money destroying side, but they love the money printing side. So they printed a ton of money Everybody printed money at the same time. Everybody said, well, I don't know what the problem is because the exchange rate's stable. So, you know, it's like when we print money, you tell us that the value of the money is going to go down because we're printing loads of it, but it's not gone down. Everything else is stable. Exchange rates all stayed the same. And then you're like, yeah, that's because everybody else is printing money at the same time. They've all taken, it's like the bunch of looters in Los Angeles. They've all sort of broken into a bloody sneaker shop and they all decided to take advantage of the fact that everybody's in the sneaker shop to grab a load of sneakers, and they've all run out with sneakers. And so they've all run out with a ton of money. They've spent it on God knows what, fighting expensive foreign wars, uh, bribing the electorate to uh, re-elect them and sleeping with their research assistants, which is basically what they do. And now they're starting to say, well, what, what, us, what, us, what? Wait, what, us? <laughs> so... You've got, um, this is always a bad sign, Look, I'll show you something. I'll see if I can show you something. If you look over there, you see that, you see that load of cars over there? That's that line of cars that's waiting to come into the roundabout that I'm waiting to come into. So, goodness knows. Let's press the button and see if I can get it. Make sure I'm centered up again. So, two years later, which is a well-known fact, according to all, uh, Economists who understand money, the Chicago School, the uh, Rothbardian, Mises School, Austrian School, call it what you like. But the people who understand that you can't just print money and make yourself rich, they, two years later is how long it takes that glut of money to find its way through into just general prices. And that's what's happening. Now, the thing is that you, um, if you own a house, as I've said before, your house, oh, hello, Santa's arrived. I think that's Santa's sleigh. No, I don't think it is. What happens is that the um, house prices go up first, and then uh, commodity prices go up. So uh, if you're having an extension done, the uh, bricks go up, timber goes up, and then finally uh, prices go up, consumer prices, and then wages. And of all of those, the uh, government puts up a half-hearted attempt to try and blame greedy capitalists for the inflation when it's the uh, it's prices going up but uh, but they put up a full-blown nuclear defense against uh, wages going up and start going on about bunkum like wage price spirals and things like that which has got a, has got a um, I don't know we've got a modicum of truth in it because uh, it's quite true that if you have put your uh, you put your prices up and then your employees come back and say, we want a 10% pay rise, which is what they'd need, just to, to, which is not even a rise. That's just to stay still. We want 10% just to compensate ourselves for the fact that the government's printed more money and our money's worth 10% less. Then um, you then have to put your prices up again. And then as soon as everyone puts their prices up again, then, then uh, the uh, wages demands start coming in again. Okay, that's the wage price spiral that the government keeps quoting. But it's not... <clears throat> It's not a spiral caused by wages. Wages is just the price of labour. In the same way as if I go down the local timber yard, the price of wood is the price of wood. 
What happens is the government prints too much money, house prices go up, uh, commodity prices go up, uh, wage, uh, consumer prices go up, wages go up, and they go up and they stabilise at a new level, like a balloon that's been held underwater. They rise to uh, stabilise at the new on the new surface. So don't believe anything about a wage price spiral. Now, I th strongly feel, obviously, as a former chief executive of trade union, although probably the most you know, moderate trade union you could imagine, uh, a single issue trade union, uh, that um, you, you have the right to withdraw your labour. I don't. And the only person who doesn't have the right to withdraw their labour is a slave. And the fact that it's inconvenient to you that I'm withdrawing my labour, I'm sorry, is tough luck. That's It's far more inconvenient for me to go without a wage than it is for you to have to find a different hospital or something, you know, or wait to get your veruca removed. So, I mean, I, considering that, you know, I think people, probably the nurses have got a moral duty to uh, continue essential services, which you can do and get a lot of sympathy from the public for doing that, while at the same time, um, you know, disrupting the service to the point where the government has to think twice about whether or not they're going to, um, you know, try and encourage a few employees back to work to do some stuff. And, and this doesn't happen really. I mean, it's, I'll tell you, why are my employees not on strike? Why are my employees not on strike? I'll tell you why. Because, first of all, I'm in the private sector, so I'm not relying on tax. I'm bearing in mind my old mantra that the government has no money. All it has is what it raises in tax. And what it can't raise in tax is it prints. I'm going to another day. Come to either islands. There you are. Oh, you are? Yes, you are. Look, hold it in front. Yeah, he's going to try and push in. No, he's done it. He's done it. He's not going to get in front of me. Anyway, but he's got in front of the bloke that way. Big Mercedes. E11 DRJ. So, you know, you can withdraw your labour and, and it's very hard and you have to be very soul searching to do that. And obviously it's better if you are in a large union and, you know, it's been, you know, and, and all very, you know, it's all very well, you know, when they say, oh, well, the tube drivers are going on strike, but the Northern Line is still open or whatever. No, because either they've got a no strike agreement with the drivers on the Northern Line or basically they, all the management and any of the drivers that haven't decided they don't want to go on strike. Um, or you know, and because they personally can meet their bills and they don't give a shit about the people who can't, uh, they put them all on one line and keep one line going. So it's a, it's a real hardship to go on strike, and people only do it because they've got no choice. And I, I think it's sad that they get the treatment that they do from the government and to a certain extent from the public, because all they're doing is they're raising the price of their labor in the same way as the guys producing timbers raised the price of his timber. And the guy who's selling a house has raised the price of his house. And they don't get the same feedback. <clears throat> if you are, so, so let's establish that, um, you know, people have got the right to go on strike unless they've negotiated away the right because they had a fat, you know, the police never do badly, I tell you. But when, when things are starting to get a bit funny, the police that's when the police start to get a lot of overtime, a lot of big pay rises. Because the government knows where it's going. So we're going to see a lot of strikes. And, um, and let's just uh, accept that with inflation at 10%, and that's CPIH inflation, which is the low measure. There is a much higher measure called the uh, Retail Price Index. RPI, and uh, that's uh, probably about 14%. And yet the media still says, oh, no, you're looking for an 8% pay increase. And and when they should immediately say, no, we're looking for an 8% pay decrease. I'm sorry, what? Yes, we're looking for an 8%. We're looking for a rise that is not quite in line with inflation, which will mean a decrease in real terms in our pay. But we're happy to accept 8%. And, and don't forget that ultimately, the ultimate message is right, that when the government prints money like this and spends it, the ultimate losers are the middle class. The, the people who are losing or will lose are the people who are going on strike now. That's why they're being resisted so 
so much and that's why they are uh, ultimately not going to get what they deserve which is the, an, an increase in wages enough to compensate for the um, decrease in the purchasing power of their pounds because the way that the way that it works well, let, hang on a second I'm just checking to see if anyone's lived here the way that it works is that the um, government spends money and then what they do is they then devalue the pound and then then they <clears throat> cause a recession which is what they're trying to do by putting up interest rates into the face of a recession they increase interest rates everybody's standard of living decreases which is what's happening now you don't need me to explain it to you just look around ask and say is my standard of living decreasing yes why because my wages aren't going up prices are going up faster than my wages therefore i'm going to have to cut back and we're going to cut back about 10 years or so we're going back to about 2013 in terms of how much money disposable income and wealth that people have got and that's how the money's paid for. It's not paid for by future generations. Everyone says, oh, no, we've given ourselves all this furlough money. Oh, we're loading it onto future generations. You're not. You loaded it onto yourself, you idiots. You've loaded it onto yourself. And now is time for the piper. We've got to pay the piper now by having a ten, a, going back one step forward, ten steps back in terms of our wealth, mainly because... Um, you know, and nurses can't, uh, all they can do is go on strike and get as much as they can, but they won't get enough to keep up. People in the private sector can set their own fees and give their staff 10% pay rises are the, uh, are, are the only people that can sort of survive at times like this because we, uh, my staff are going to be there, apart from the one that's sick, of course. All right, okay, that's been a big one today, but um, uh, play it again. Don't play uh, one of 1.4 this one just play it at normal play it at half speed until you get it okay all right <laughs> bye